Welcome everyone, uh, good afternoon. Um, and for this session, I have three distinguished guests. And what I shall do is uh, read out uh, their mini CV so it doesn't take up too long. Uh, on my immediate left, I have uh, Enchet Mohammed Balian Sulaiman. He has 30 years experience with Petronas. Uh, he's part of the pioneering team that presented the business case to Petronas board and La Buon Authority for the setting up of Enegas back in 2005. He became the Enegas CEO in 2018, and currently he is also serving on the board of La Buan Ri. Uh, next is Encha Nasri Wong. Nasri's been in the business for 17 years uh, in the insurance industry, starting with broking, general insurance, and then as an insurance manager today. Uh, he's got a diverse non-insurance industry experience for 14 years prior to coming into the insurance industry, so a lot of experience. Nasri is the head of commercial operations with Brighton Management, as well as the principal officer for Park Lane uh, PCC, that's the protected cell captive. Uh, and then last but no means least, we have Lawrence Bird. He's got 35 years in insurance, 23 years in captive business, of which seven he served in Guernsey and 16 in Bermuda. And uh, we welcome him to the region. He's just recently relocated to Singapore in February this year uh, to head up the Asia Pacific captive practice for WTW, which I believe stands for Willis, as everyone will know. Uh, so with no further ado, we would like to uh, uh, start with our panelists and go into what is the first of five questions which have been raised under this topic. Uh, and I'll put that to Lawrence uh, to answer first, and I'll just create the title, which is Creative Use for Captives, How Captive Owners, Managers, Brokers are Managing Post-COVID and the Related Challenges and Opportunities. What's your view, Lawrence? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Lee. Um, my view is quite long, so um, I'm going to try and stop myself before Lee stops me, because um, it's a big, big topic. Uh, and I think your next question will probably be joined in with us as well. But um, uh, where do you start um, post-COVID? Well, let's start pre-COVID. Pre um, I think captive owners, uh, prospective owners, um, and the like, I think it was already a hardening insurance market. So, um, and so, the, the, so the captive benefits and opportunities had started. Uh, pre-COVID um, to some degree and um, there was also perhaps associated with, associated with that um, hard market was some contracting capacity in some areas um, and then of course there was COVID itself and the two years of um, how are things going to pan out, how are things are going to work um, and, and I think we all know a lot of the challenges that go with that, you know, there's, there's resources um, inflation, wage expectations, supply chain, of course, partly that's down to the geopolitical risks um, that, uh, that we're, all, we're all feeling right now. Um, fuel costs going up and up. Um, other challenges, of course, cash flow, uh, which of course is massive to any business and where really captives can play a big part in stabilizing a business. And of course, the business interruption itself. Um, I think technology, pre-COVID and during COVID was uh, a challenge. Um, but then again, it takes us to the opportunities because I think most, most challenges present opportunities. And again, technology was something I think the industry very much turned around. Um, if it's, and it's a two-edged sword. Um, clearly it helps with the efficiency and um, uh, having had a, a brief break, which we didn't bother in my, my CV, but a, a brief break coming into, back into the industry after a couple of years, uh, it was noticeable how much technology had moved on in terms of remote meetings and video calls three years ago were nothing like as efficient as they are today. Um, so again, there was some stuff there. But of course, technology again brings risk, and we'll get into this probably later. Um, you know, with the cyber, uh, cyber risks associated with that technology. We were talking at lunchtime that those type of risks just didn't happen um, when I started a long time ago in captives. Those technology risks were not there. Y2K was talked about, but that was about it. So, um, so I think 
uh, that has led to, to some opportunities. And, and in the captive space, to get to the point, I suppose, is um, what we haven't seen, uh, there's no silver bullet, there never is a silver bullet that, that cures everything. Um, we're seeing enormous interest in areas that perhaps have not been traditional for captives. But first and foremost, um, our experience is that we are seeing captive owners looking at their current program. The first things first, they're looking at the current program with a view to increasing retention levels. Um, you know, as the market stays hard, we might have seen some softening in some places, but definite hardening in others. Um, you know, they want to say, let's look at my current program, um, are my retention levels optimizing the benefit for us as a group? And I think that's where we've seen um, the, 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 biggest, um, the biggest change. Um, once they've done that, then they are looking at additional lines as well. Um, cyber, we've already talked about. Uh, quite a complicated topic in itself because if I talk to companies, I'll say to them, what is your risk? Some will know, some aren't sure. And then if they do know what the risk is, what's the exposure? How do they quantify that exposure? And again, that becomes quite hard for a number of companies. And yet they're mystified by how the underwriters in the external market are still able to command en enormous premiums to what they were perhaps paying three or four years ago. And so they are looking for solutions there. And we, we've seen great interest across the globe in terms of the cyber uh, opportunities for captives. And, and increasingly, I, I'm certainly seeing that, um, that happen here. Um, do you want me to take a break? No, no, no. Hour ago? <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, what, what I might try and do is just uh, ask Nasri what he, he feels about the topic itself from a, from a Labuan perspective where you've seen, uh, as a manager, uh, captives diversify their approach with these hard times. Uh, well, Labuan as it is, uh, as Doreen was saying this morning, we are part of Malaysia. And we are fortunate in the sense that uh, in Labuan, we get a lot of uh, uh, captives' uh, potentials from Europe where we see a lot of things that are being done there, which are, which are certainly uh, innovative to us, because we don't see that in the Malaysian market. What, uh, what I need to say in this conference is that the captive solution is pretty new, pretty nascent in Malaysia. So a lot of people here, I think, in this forum uh, are coming here, as, 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 as was the uh, survey this morning, to gain knowledge about captive. So I got to say this. Captive solution may or may not work for you, so there is a set of things that you need to do. Uh, one of them is to have a structured study. Uh, what I mean by structure is to get a professional to do the feasibility study. If it works for you, then you move to the second step. Um, so I'm here to give a shout out to all the Malaysians who are here today. I mean, this conference is for those who are in the know, but for those who are really not in the know, uh, you need to speak to some professionals and we do have a lot of professionals in Labuan that you can talk to. I'm not just saying us, but there are others as well. So I'm looking at it from that perspective, from the Malaysian market point of view. Yeah. And Baliam, we spoke at lunch. You, you were talking about how your very successful captive uh, will itself start looking at, uh, at creative new ways to use your captive for, for Petronas uh, and its partners um, going forward. Can you elaborate on some of the ideas you, you want to be creative about? Okay, thanks, Ri. I think first, for captive, the, actually the, the, the fundamental is still the same. So first, as a captive, you, we need to, to have an understanding of the fundamental. So what's the fundamental, the way I look at it? First, the fundamental is first, we know it look from the risk management perspective. For the insured, not the client, the client not the captive, basically, it's good for them to manage the risk for the attritional loss, meaning that's a, at the low level. And then for insurance company, normally insurance company, they want to ensure that's considered very high volatility, low frequency. So that's their, their forte or the area that they want. So where the captive will be? So captive actually need to find what we call the sweet spot. So sweet spot is actually between how much that the insured or the client willing to absorb and then, on top of that is the sweet spot for captive. But then, to what extent that it will not basically 
have some conflict with the insurance company. So that's the sweet spot. That actually for whenever there is any list, for example, post-COVID, that is the same concept. First, you see what's the exposure. You try to understand the exposure, and then let's see, actually, which is the sweet spot for all these players, for the insured, for captive, as well as for the, for the insurance company. So then when you find the sweet spot, then of course, captive also will look into the gap. Gap meaning that insurance company cannot provide because they don't know the risk. Captive, the, the benefit of captive, they understand the risk. For example, for any gas. Any gas, we start to write pipeline. Pipeline, when we see that the market doesn't really want to insure pipeline. So then we do our internal study. Of course, it must be supported with technical. So the technical is basically to understand the exposure, and then from there you will calculate the expected loss, and then from there you can determine the price. So, so that's the, the approach. Whenever there is uh, the new challenge, so that's the area that we need to look for. For post-COVID, I can see there are issues on the business interruption, the supply chain, and also cyber. So we have to go through the same process, meaning we see with the sweet spot, what actually the exposure, and then whether captive can take it, and then what would be the gap. There could be insurance out there, but what is the gap? So the gap, that's the part that actually captive can, can play the role. Okay. I think this leads ideally into the next uh, topic, which is um, identifying innovative captive solutions, whether you're looking at uh, parametric solutions or using the traditional reinsurance market or accessing the ILS market, uh, and also looking at you know, what are, are, are difficult areas today, such as DNO and cyber, which are experiencing significant uplift in premiums, uh, and also employee benefit programs where people can, can benefit from, from looking at their own uh, EB uh, solutions within a captive as well as with uh, their insurance partners. Uh, Lawrence, would you like to take on and tell us a, a little bit more about your feelings on this subject? Sure. Certainly, yeah. And, and um, DNO and, and employee benefits is very much on my, on my list here. So, um, um, and we'll come back to the parametrics. But yeah, D DNO, and this, this partly is the previous point as well. Again, is, a, is another area that's being um, um, looked at quite frequently. Again, now side C cover, of course, is, is, is the one that um, that can fit for a captive program side A and B really the directors aren't necessarily going to accept the paper of the captive necessarily and, and might feel exposed still. So side C is definitely there. Um, that said, you know, I'd seen DNO go into, a, into captives 20, 20 years ago. Um, but it's definitely um, more of more interest now. I think um, depending on the development of DNO liability around the world, I think it's it's, you know, there's no escape for that from directors in any jurisdiction now. And so we're seeing more interest in this region. Um, and um, so I think we'll, we, we will see that start to creep into, into the captive space. Um, employee benefits is, a, a, again, another big topic by itself. Um, but, you know, we, again, we've seen, we're seeing interest um, um, with existing captive owners and prospective captive owners around employee benefits. But, of course, what are employee benefits? It's a very, very broad topic. Um, it could be a relatively simple risk, perhaps where medical benefits are provided to employees under a contract. And, um, you know, our view is very much that you can get that into your captive pretty simply. It's like, a, you know, like a medical benefits or we may have seen medical stop loss. Uh, I've been involved in many of those, the other side of the globe, if you like. Um, and then the more complex areas, employee benefits, uh, where you start getting into more of the, the long-term stuff, uh, long-term disability, life insurance, that's a lot more complex, I think, for captives and takes a, a, a huge amount of um, feasibility study work uh, before getting that into a captive, notwithstanding the fact that there would possibly be some regulatory hoops to go through because potentially you're starting to talk about insuring directly the, in, the, the employee rather than, rather than the insured being the co company. Uh, where there's a contractual basis, I think it's easy. I think it's still first-party business. Um, so definitely those are absolutely two areas that, uh, that um, captive owners are looking at. Are they creative uses? Um, uh, yes and no. Um, but they're definitely areas that are being focused on again right now um, and very much in this region. And so another area that is, that is new, I think, um, and I know this is going to be addressed in the four o'clock session, so I don't want to go into that, um, and nor would I be an expert on it either. But ESG type risks are, are definitely starting to grab captive owners' attention to think, um, 
can, can we use our captive here for some of, some of these risks? Um, you know, um, I've been involved in two feasibility studies in the last few weeks um, where a particular industry group, um, by its very nature, is going to struggle with the environmental side of the ESG risks. And the market is slowly pulling away because insurers are going to say, we can't insure you anymore. Um, regulations are getting too hard uh, for this, this area. We can't be seen to support that. Um, and so they're looking to create captives now to build up funds for maybe five, six, seven or eight years uh, when the capacity is completely gone. Um, so we've seen a lot of interest there um, and have done work on that. So, and it may be on ESG risks as well. Um, you know, if that, if, and, and, and indeed, other perhaps uninsurable risks, if we call, want to call it that. Um, you know, the banks, the finance, uh, financing entities, they want to see evidence of cover. And, and so I think a captive can play, can play a part there. Um, so we're, see, we're seeing, um, and then coming on to things like parametrics, um, I think now um, companies are very much looking for alternative solutions you know the captive the captives have been around since the 1920s in some form and you know maybe that's a, an argument to say that's an alternative well it's more of an alternative risk financing than risk for its transfer strategy but it's been around that long but they are now looking beyond the insurance market even beyond captives to say what else can i look at what other solutions are out there um, for for us to look at and in terms of uh, a lot of strategic reviews that we're getting into now, and they, again, these are increasing because people want to know what, what else can they do with their captive. Uh, feasibility studies for new captive owners in the region are definitely, definitely increasing. And part of that, you know, we, we, are, we are talking to the ART guys to say, what can we do in terms of parametrics or other type of solutions? And, you know, the captive, I can even think of one that is offering a small, relatively small um, parametric cover um, along the way, um, but you know the captive could can play with that market and and, and 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 either access the market through the captive or the captive takes a percentage. So yeah, we're definitely seeing increases in that, and I would highly recommend that that insurance buyers start to look for alternative solutions to really complete the picture as to what's available for them. Yeah, I, I guess you're obviously talking about uh, people who are involved in coal and mining. <laughs> within the ESG sector and um, HLAP, we have a number of coal plants on our books and it's becoming increasingly difficult um, in the global market. It doesn't matter whether it's treaty or FAC to, to find a solution. So I think this topic is, is very apt in that uh, self-insurance is gonna be something that a number of players will have to promote. Do you find that captives um, are now being able to look at a broader field in both the treaty and the FAC when trying to address self-insurance, or is it still very much a, a facultative, um, long-term strategic play? So you can, you can either do a facultative year-on-year -year or perhaps a structured solution with the facultative market, or do you see that the treaty players are actually now interplaying with captives, large captives especially, going forward? In, in, in my experience, it's still, still very much facultative. Um, you know, I have, I have seen... Um, um, a project we got involved in with uh, a treaty, um, treaty reinsurance, um, but it was quite a specific area, and I wouldn't think it's worth discussing here because it's not general enough for, for I think for captive owners. But generally, it's still on the fact side, I would say, yes. Um, but again, that's something worth worth exploring. Um, Nasri, have you got got a viewpoint on self-insurance and and perhaps the tolerance that uh, Malaysian captives? Uh, the UC are, are increasing their self-insurance because of hardening costs, perhaps. Well, actually, I have a question for Lawrence. Uh, when you talk about, sorry, sorry, Lee. <laughs> so yes, when you talk about DNO, uh, the site A, site B sort of thing, would it be possible for a site A uh, insurance to be kept in a cell? Because legally speaking, the, the cell, because it's part of the, the, the core, is a separate legal entity from the owner of the, you know, those who wants to have DNO coverage. What's your take on that? Um, it's going to take me a minute to think about that. Could you put that on Slido for me first? Sorry. Right. So, um, <laughs> um, I think that has potential. Yeah. I do. And, 
And, and, it, and, 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 and don't get me wrong, it, it doesn't mean that side A and side B has not gone into, into a captive or self-insured program. It most definitely has. But I think you're right. If, if it's a cell in, in another vehicle, which is issuing the paper, then uh, I think there is potential for that to satisfy, ultimately, those that are looking for the cover. And uh, I would say, now, whether that cell company needs to go the further, uh, f go further and get a rating, um, that might help solidify that position even more. Um, um, that's not a plug for AM Best. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, Lee, you were saying? <laughs> I was asking if you were finding that uh, your Malaysian clients are increasing their, their self-insurance uh, which is the topic about increasing the, their retention profile as the market hardens? Well, actually, uh, most of the clients that we spoke to uh, in the initial years, most of them do not want to retain any risk uh, because, like I said, it's, it's pretty new for them to retain risk. There's a, little, little a bit of anxiousness there to retain some risk. So what we do advise the clients is that you could just run uh, an experience um, over a period of years, say one or two, three years, and see how it goes. Look at your experience. If you feel that, you know, by the third year, if you feel that you want to retain some, you retain some. Nobody comes in uh, and actually said, I want to retain 100%. So far, in my own experience. And Balian, obviously, your company has, has obviously started the captive off a number of years ago and developed into increasing your self insurance. Uh, I believe that the market, especially the offshore energy market, has been quite stable. We've seen peaks in the uh, non-marine energy market where rising in price and premium rates had gone up substantially due to losses. Your view on whether, you know, your captive has, has the sort of vision of increasing that self you, you talked about a sweet spot, and I think that's, that's probably where you've learned to get your captive to today. But what, what do you think will be the road in future in terms of self-insurance? Okay, for, for self-insurance, actually, actually because we, we know there are, there are a few questions that have been flashed to us up front, which I may touch about it. The captive is always is something, the vehicle that can be used to manage the risk. So I think when there, whenever there are change, as long that you first, as long as which I think even my, my team that we also need to to improve ourselves is to become customer centric. Why we need to understand customer centric? Because then you understand what is their pain. And then from their pain, then you know what the service that you can provide. Because actually when NIC has been set up, one of the importance not mentioned by our president at that time, said that you don't simply create an insurance product that they don't need. It's just because you want to earn income, then you create that product. So, so that's not the way. But if you look into the customer centric, then you can see what's their pain, and then you can see what's the gap. For I give, I give an example that we have, for example, we have contract, contract with contractor. So contractor, we are doing project, normally they want to have insurance, because in, in contract, you mentioned about insurance, they want to have a low deductible insurance. But then from the insurance company, they said they cannot give that low deductible, but it must be supported in the contract. So what happened, we have a low deductible in the contract, but then we only, as Petronas, we can only procure high deductible, so in between, that's the captive play their role. So captive set what would be the amount, because we know the history, the loss ratio, then we know the, the exposure, then from there we see what would be, then we also have, the, then because it's, a, it's captive, then you can come up with your mechanism. If you got suffer loss, what you're going to get back your money in what period of time? So of course, that part that needs some, some technicality to, 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 to develop or to come up with the product as long as it's a considered a risk transfer mechanism. So, so that's the way I look at it. Is there are plenty of room. I think we will touch later on when we talk about some of the questions that in the department. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then let's uh, open with Nasri on the next question, which is how will captives fast track uh, the shift in the risk uh, landscape and dynamics? <clears throat> yeah, well, especially now, isn't it, because of the hard market. Um, if, if, you, if you have decided to set up a captive, um, I'm going to take a literal answer to that. If you have decided to set up captive and you want to uh, get into the, uh, the captive scene, so to speak, the captive space, so to speak, the easiest way is to set up a cell in Labuan. Uh, we could get your cell up and running uh, within 
one to two months, yeah, tops. Um, so long as you have come up with a due date, uh, your feasibility studies. So what we do here for you, uh, not only us, the interest manager, is that we need to ensure that the captive meets the standard as required by the authority. I mean here, the Lab 1 FSA. We have a lot of ideas flying around, but then again, if there's no insurable interest, there's no first party uh, risk to be insured uh, through the capital, you, you, can't get it, uh, you can't get it done. Uh, so we need to establish that first. The numbers will come later. Once we get a schematic of what you want to do uh, for the captive, solution, uh, captive structure, uh, if, we, if we like it, uh, we feel that it can pass through the regulator, then we look at the numbers. Of course, the numbers will need to, to, to define uh, what the captive needs to do, whether it's just a retention pool, uh, whether you want to sit out and, and earn a right income. Uh, for us, uh, it's a balance. Uh, there's no point setting up a captive without any retention. You need to retain some. That's the whole idea of setting up a captive. If you want to sit out everything and just arrive, come, yeah, that's fine with you, but that should not be a long-term solution uh, to set up a captive in a loved one. It is, a, it is not a short-term solution. Captive is, is a drawn-out, uh, long-term thing, if you like. Uh, it, it, it's, it's difficult uh, to, to exit once you have done it because you know some of the policies are long tail, if you, especially if you do life captive. So you need to uh, establish that uh, in the first step before you even venture into that, into that space. Yeah, okay. Um, Lawrence, I'd sort of like to put you a little bit on the spot and, and come up with something just to, with regard to speed of, of the process so as, as, a, as a broker consultant in, in the captive space. So if you were to have a, a client who um, suddenly turns around and says, my legislation is changing, I need to have a gradual pollution solution, your immediate thought is captive is going to be the best place for you. Uh, what, what would be the time scales for you and, and the processes that you would take a client through in order to achieve you know, uh, a suitable product for, for that client? And would Lab One be that domicile? I think there's two sides to this, to this answer, if, if I may. So to answer that particular part, um, assuming that the company does not have a captive already, uh, unfortunately, I think the process is is slower than I, I personally would like it to be. And there's, there's, there's two reasons for that. Um, one, you know, really the feasibility work needs to be done. The data has to be looked at and the whole viability of the project is gonna take um, months rather than weeks to probably, to probably fix. Um, and then assuming it's doable, uh, then, then you're into, uh, and part of that review will, of course, should talk about the domicile. Um, and then, you know, whichever domicile it is, there's going to be a period then to, to um, file for the application to get the insurance license. And again, uh, I'm not aiming this at any, any particular domicile, but I think those, uh, I, I do wonder if that whole process can be done more, more quickly because it does, it does slow down the um, um, agility of a captive, if you like. Where, where it does, uh, on the other side of the, the, the answer, um, an existing cell or an existing captive can be very, very quick and nimble, I think. Um, that said, to be bringing in a new program such as gradual pollution, it's going, to, um, it's going to need some work. So your analysis needs to take place. But I think, um, but the fact that you've got it already set up, you know, you, you really benefit from um, having a captive or a cell in terms of the speed that you can then pull the trigger to make it go, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, it was a bit of a loaded question. So, yeah. Lab One has a PCC Correct. Uh, environment, which is very conducive for clients who need to fast track in the event of yep. Um, yep. a change in the dynamics of the environment that they work in. So, uh, are there parties where PCCs are operating at the moment that, that complement um, parties to go into besides Lab One? What, what other areas are in, there? In, in this the region? Yeah. Um, as far as I'm aware, there are possibly none. Um, that said, uh, we have, um, we did organize uh, or get involved in um, turning in, uh, Cook Islands company into a cell company by private act. So rather than the legislation, it was done by private act. And that is a cell company um, with its own, its own act saying that it is. Um, um, oh, clear, clearly outside of Asia Pacific region, there, there are numerous domiciles um, that have the cell legislation, but I think in terms of this region, it's a, it's a great thing for Lab One to have, 
and um, um, I, I, I'm not a regulator, and I'm obviously on the other side of the fence to some degree, but I'd highly recommend domiciles going down that route. Yeah, I would. Balian, any, any thoughts on that shortly? Okay, I, 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 do, I look into two, two aspects. First, the, the one about the, the protected cell captive. The way I look at it, because this is one of the options for you to set a captive, or if you already have a captive, if you think the new area that you're going to go, it does not fit your captive because of the accounting requirement or maybe you need uh, actuarial. So actually, the way I look at it, the PCC is the option that is, is a straightforward and faster solution. Because you don't have to invest a lot, you don't have no, not many people you, is required, as well the accounting all been based in the PCC rather than you have to develop that. So that's, that's the way I look at it. The, the second aspect I want to touch about the rich landscape. Uh, rich landscape, the way I look at it for, for, for Petrona, for example, it's not really about the PCC, it's just to understand the rich landscape itself. So for Petronas now, we see about the ESG, so people may move to other part of the industry or supply chain. For example, we go to solar. So when it comes to solar, then you can see there could be another risk attached to solar. For example, the extended unit to have the extended warranty. So that's part of area where captive can start to explore how to provide the service or solution to to the to your business. That, that's why captive, as we again go back to the customer centric, you must keep pace what is the requirement by your business. Once you understand the business, then you may understand the the gain uh, the, the gap or their pain which can be translated to opportunity. Okay. We'll we'll take a little break on the thing and, and take one of the questions which has come up. Um, uh, which is, do captives need to obtain a separate license before they can be allowed to underwrite EB program, life insurance in particular? Uh, Lawrence, I think this will be your question. The short answer is, it depends. So, um, it depends on, on the regulator and the regulatory regime. It depends on the product that we're talking about. Um, more often than not, I would say it would not need it, would be my argument. Um, even for a life insurance program, if it's a group life insurance program that's annually renewable, I would argue that that is not long-term business in itself. Um, and there are regulators that would consider it that way. Generally speaking, though, if it's, um, if it's, if it's not onerous um, to get the life side then um, and you can get a composite license uh, in certain jurisdictions some have stopped that but I, I don't I don't know I can't answer sit here and pretend I know uh, the lab one regulations around that um, so you know I'll, I'll defer to to the regulators on that but um, generally speaking you know regulators are going to be looking at a long-term product if it's more than 60 months, so five years, and, and, and therefore that would start to really lean towards needing a, a life license. If a, if a composite license is, 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 a, is available and, um, and doesn't change the regulatory landscape too much for the captive, then um, it's certainly worth looking at for an EB program. But a lot of EB risks are less than that um, time scale, and, um, and therefore a life license should not be required, in my opinion. Um, what was I going to say? Something else popped into my head there. Um, I'll tell you what, where it does make it more complicated, though, anything more than a year is going to be the dreaded IFRS 17 that someone asked a question about earlier, which I think was called Lawrence Bird. And, um, you know, that's, that's going to be potentially a headache because any, any, any contracts that are more than a year um, are going to be treated differently uh, for IFRS 17 purposes. And IFRS 17, in my opinion, is, is absurd for captives. Um, and um, so that, that will potentially cause some pain. But hopefully, that said, only in the early stages. I think implementation will be a problem. But ongoing, I think once, once the industry's got to grip, grips with it, it shouldn't be as onerous. Yeah. Okay. So it probably doesn't answer the question uh, as much because it does depend. Bali, and I'll come back to you to, uh, to answer the fourth question, uh, fourth topic, which is how captives can use um, alternative reinsurance capital to bring stability in uneconomically attractive rate uh, against the backdrop of a hard market? Tough okay. question. <laughs> okay, so first I think you need to understand the alternative reinsurance capital, what is their advantage? Uh, so basically they give extra capital, of course, 
and then they also give you maybe the cost to have them is cheaper compared to insurance and then maybe their appetite towards risk is different or they take it simpler approach so so that's basically the advantage so then when you talk back to captive because you, you, I, i've seen that like Swiss Re, they also use this uh, alternative regional capital, even though before that they are considered quite big, but they use that to actually for, for the growth and opportunity. So similar to, to captive, where there is any area which we already we are facing actually, uh, now is considered very hard for the downstream construction. So then you can see because of the COVID, post-COVID, some of the construction, they have been delayed, the project duration. Because of that, due to the treaty of reinsurance, they cannot offer the insurance more than certain period. Then you can see there is a gap. So that's where then you can see whether you want to use the, you have, you can use the alternative uh, reinsurance capital. And that's the advantage of captive because captive can have access to this reinsurance capital like other insurance company. So it just matter now whether that is a viable or not in terms of economic sense. And then again, go back to, to the client, what is their expertise. So for example, Due to the hard market, some of the construction they only can cover estimated maximum loss. But actually, the estimated maximum loss is subject to exposure that maybe your calculation is wrong, so it can be beyond the estimated maximum loss when the incident happened. So then there is still exposure there. So do you how you want to protect? And then the insurance capital can play a role to cover that part. It just matter then where go back to the client. Are they willing to to pay to cover the extra exposure that may happen if the EML is not correct? So there's one example how to use the. Yeah, I think uh, AM Best earlier touched upon the fact that obviously uh, the transparency and the benefit of having a credit rating helps you you and your company have a, an excellent credit rating. Um, Lawrence, you, you, in, in use of the um, alternative partnerships with the likes of the big reinsurers, I think they provide solutions to other parties rather than credit rating where you can partner with them to improve the credit rating of a captive. Uh, can you touch upon that, where that, uh, i.e. the likes of using Swiss Re or Munich or some of the other big companies to, to work with captives as an alternative route of, of, of providing capital? In, in, in terms of the rating of the captive? Or? Uh, in terms of support of right. that captive itself, they, I, I believe there are ways of working with such partners to, to yeah. provide capital support. Right. So, um, yeah, and again, um, as, as you probably know as well, the, that, you know, there's a... Um, there are a whole bunch of now um, uh, different products, if you want to call it that, um, that uh, people are starting to look at, uh, certainly advisors are looking at. Um, and I think, as we said earlier, you know, we'd recommend insurance buyers to really start uh, looking at perhaps the alternative market. I think, I think what's, what's been interesting is that um, you know, we've seen um, uh, a growth in sophisticated hedging solutions, um, so much so that I think CFOs are starting to get involved in the uh, in the process as much as insurance managers or risk managers. So they're very interested, and in, I think in some of those capital market type solutions um, and alternative reinsurance solutions that are, that are existing. Um, you know, we've talked about parametrics a little bit already, and, and it's I, I kind of put them in that bucket of, of the overall alternative risk strategy. And, and what we didn't talk about earlier when we talked about parametrics, and I think are relevant, um, are the, are the non-damaged business interruption covers that are available through, through that, you know, either through the pandemic, which is the obvious one, um, where perhaps there wasn't cover uh, during that, um, that period where everybody was struggling, but there perhaps are non-damaged BI parametric solutions around now, um, climate change, social displacement, um, cyber attacks we've talked about. Um, and so I think that there's, a, there's a lot of interest there. But then again, I think if we then look into some other markets where um, the reinsurance market is, is, seems to be um, able to assist with some structured solutions, um, multi-line, multi-year um, type uh, coverages, which again, I think can help to um, smooth the um, the time scale and, and, the, and the losses for the captive. I think there's, there's a there's a definite advantage to there in looking at perhaps bringing some of those risks together under an umbrella of a structured structured type solutions. Um, yeah. And, and Nasri, uh, are you seeing any sort of dynamic change in the way some of the captives are buying 
uh, their reinsurance, either by using an ILS or using uh, some deeper form of uh, stop loss to their own retention as, as the market hardens. Good question. Um, most of the captive uh, owners, um, they do work with brokers. So it depends a lot on the, how the brokers advise them. We've seen, we've seen one or two cases where they actually uh, restructure their, their reinsurance coverage. I think uh, most likely because of the pandemic itself. There were some artifacts. Um, so yeah, so it, it really depends. Uh, um, without divulging too much, I think there's some movement in that, in that space. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, and we'll come to the final topic of, of today's session, which is uh, determining the appropriate investment strategies and approach that is best suited for various scenarios, a very wide subject here uh, as well. So, uh, Balian, how would you uh, address that issue? Okay, actually, when I first look to this question, it's quite challenging for me. <laughs> but just to share some experience, when, when, when I become a CEO captive, basically uh, my background is uh, actual science and doing insurance. So, but then you realize you have to understand the accounting aspect, the investment aspect, but I don't say that I'm good at that. So for, for investment, normally for captive, I think in reality, in reality, captive, their modus operandi is very lenient, meaning there are not many people, and then you rely on your parent to do your investment, in our case, group treasury. So we are subject to what their investment strategy, so that number one. But then we, then we need to engage with them, so for them to understand what's the requirement, our requirement, either a regulatory requirement, and then also our business requirement, for example, have to pay claim because of the solvency margin and also to stand stand on the AMBS rating, for example. So from there, then we discuss about the mandate, the investment mandate. So what they propose to us, but I can see they, 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 they play, play along between all these instruments, either cash, money market, or fixed deposit, or bond. So we have seen that they switch from one area to another area to see where is they can have gain and when they can cut, cut loss. Basically, that's the way I look, which I think we need to have engagement with the, the person or the department that really do investment to understand the exposure and their strategy. But then we have to align to what is our uh, business strategy. So, so I think that's, that's the, the approach that I would suggest if we face in this kind current arrangement because it's quite we talk about inflation, now we talk about stagnation, and then we talk about the recession. So they, they have their own scenarios, and then what would they do for when they come, when the scenarios arise? So, so I think that's a bit general answer, but I think that's a okay. yeah. Lawrence, going to the other scale of obviously a very large company, if you were to, um, as a broker, advise more like an SME, mid-sized company, on what firstly their capitalization and secondly their investment strategy should be. Obviously, as a broker, you're in a difficult position as to whether you say low, medium, or high, mm. uh, and obviously a captive starting out probably has a different strategy from what it will develop over a period of time. C can you give us your detailed comment on that? Um, yes, I think so. Um, I mean, ultimately, I think we, we would always advise a captive to be um, cautious with this investment strategy because, um, and, and particularly in the early days, but I think that tends to continue because you know that that captive has to pay claims. You know, it's uh, it's it's an insurance company that has to pay claims ultimately, and it needs to have the funds to do so. Um, now, the parent company is not going to be an insurance company and so their core business is completely different and their investment strategy um, could be different um, and again it, it very much tends that the as, as Balian said you know they're going to follow the parent company um, investment strategy equally though we'd say to a client that's fine but just be careful because you are an insurance company and your risk profile might be different to the parents' risk profile. Um, now, where, where the two can really tie in very, very well, um, you know, obviously one of the concerns about setting up a captive is going to be the level of capitalization required. And um, that can be quite subjective. Um, and 
but equally the captive needs to be able to stand on its own two feet, uh, particularly in the early years if a, if a big claim or series of claims come through, it needs to be able to meet them. And you don't want to expose your capital or go, go back to the parent and ask for more capital. So, um, so they're going to be putting up what might seem to be a high level of capital to start with. Um, but the beauty is that most captives can, can loan those funds back to the parent, so the parent can then invest it in the core business and still make the capital work for them. Uh, there are conditions around that, uh, the regulatory conditions, but also, uh, you know, it's important to know that uh, there needs to be a loan agreement in place that says, you know, the captive can recall that loan at any stage that it needs to. There's going to have to be an arm's length interest rate that's associated with that. And very similar to loan backs, um, you know, we've seen over the years a lot of interest in, in, in cash pooling. So, uh, so they're getting the benefit of the overall global cash pool. But again, it needs to be very much um, uh, tied to the captive and identified as the captive assets. Um, and I've started to see that question be asked a little bit over here as well, which is great. Yeah, yeah, so it's good. Yeah, so I think, you know, when it comes to investments, dull and boring is the way to go, unfortunately, for, for a captive. Yeah, yeah. And, and Nasri, do you see uh, a sort of divergent view for the various captive that you look after, or is it a very much a, a plain vanilla approach for, for most investment strategies? Very much plain vanilla. Um, you, you must understand, uh, most of the captive that we do have are Japanese. Uh, not, not the same, with all due respect, but Japanese are very traditional uh, captive owners, so they're very tra pretty traditional. All right. Um, let's turn to some of the questions which have been posed. Um, this one is from AKS. What will be a sizable benchmark in terms of premium for a company to participate or set up a captive, either its own captive or set up as a sell. Um, I think I'll put that to the broker to begin with. <laughs> um, I don't like these questions. It's not a good idea, this slide though. <laughs> anyway, so um, sizable, I, I, I would say so a, a sizable premium. I guess we're looking at what, what's the minimum, okay? I think it's probably what the, is that the question perhaps it means? And I think for a captive, Again, nothing's set in stone, and there are mo many variables, but generally, you're probably going to be looking at a, a million dollars of premium, a uh, million. You want to have a million dollars premium spend um, uh, before a captive is going to start. start Single sell, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, um, and in terms of the sell, Nasri could probably advise better than me, but I think that figure can start to come down because your annual, oh, okay. oper so your annual operating costs are going to be less. A sell could fair? be much less than yeah, a million. Much less than a million. A million okay. is a pretty... Pretty much a benchmark for yeah. pure captive. And we're in US dollars, not yeah, ringgit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, would, I would agree with that. Yeah. And just as a sort of guide, what, what did Petronas, if it's not a secret, start its uh, uh, sort of premium spend out when it, it started? It's large, I know. Uh, it's large, less. It's, it's more than, I, th I think first because the, the mine quite big, it's more than 100 million US dollar. Number two, the loss ratio. Loss ratio at that time is 30%. So then from there, you can see, you understand the, there's more opportunity for us to, to contain the premium leakage. So, so I think that, but, but I think another part, actually for us, because we start in March, but then our renewal is first April. So, but we want to retain, but we couldn't get it at that particular because only one month, but then the next, the following year, we straight away retain the risk, I think at that time, 20 million ringgit as our starting point. So, of course, you have to <laughs> pray, cross your fingers. Yeah. Hopefully nothing happened during that time. <laughs> but, but I think that's, that's, that's the nature. But, but of course, you have that, then of course, you have the, the mechanism. The mechanism meaning that if indeed there are some claim, then how you want to recover back yeah. your money. So, so basically, that's <laughs> the approach. Okay. Uh, next question um, from Kay Naidu is, can you place risk with a Labuan captive for third-party clients? but whom has indirect insurable interest. Lawrence, you want to start that one off? No. Um, so, <laughs> these are good questions. So, um, again, I think this is, um, it's an interesting question because I think it's, uh, it does present opportunities. Um, I I'm going to, again, hold my hand up and say that I don't know the regulations in Labo 1 well enough as yet, but where the, 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 the most common place that we'll see um, third party interest in a captive program is probably through joint ventures. Um, and uh, I, I would imagine 
Bali, I might see that in his business a, a, a lot more and, and maybe be able to uh, shed some light on that. So I think that's definitely an area um, um, where this could come up the most. And uh, the reason I say that is because, you know, those joint ventures that companies are involved in, um, have they got the control of, of the entity in terms of risk management? Um, you know, a captive owner generally is going to be a, a sophisticated uh, have a sophisticated risk management um, um, uh, philosophy where the captive is part of that and they're going to feel confident writing those risks within their own captive because they're happy with their risk management process. Now, with a joint venture, if they don't have that control, um, how can they and therefore the regulator be comfortable that the same uh, control is there, and I don't think they can. So again, we see variations of this in terms of what's allowable. Um, generally speaking, uh, regulators will allow uh, up to the percentage of the holding in the joint venture to go through the captive, um, but some will say, even if you don't have a majority uh, stake in the joint venture, if you have control from a risk management point of view, they will then allow it to be written. Um, so, and I don't know how that, that exactly plays out with Labo One. Uh, there are numerous other types of third party areas that can participate in a captive, um, and it might be in terms of, and I'm not, I can't think of anything in this region particularly, but you know, in terms of. Um, um, products that are sold to customers and with an insurance that goes with that. Um, you know, that's, that's an area perhaps you could say is a connected third party risk. And, and we already talked about employee benefits as, we, uh, as well, which could, could um, have an element of third party risk. So they're all, all things that have to be looked at individually. So again, um, I wouldn't want to disappoint the person asking the question, but again, it, it depends on, on a number of things. I think, Nasri, you can confirm that both first and third party captives are allowed subject to regulator approval. Can you elaborate? The, the simple answer is no, you can't. Um, <laughs> I agree with Lawrence. But then again, yes, the yes and no. Uh, there is a provision in the act where you can, you can allow, you, you, you are able to do third party with approval from the authority. So if you intend to do third party risk, uh, talk to one of the professionals, get up, your, get up the, uh, the structure up, we'll look at it, uh, and then if it's feasible, then we'll talk to the regulator. Um, I think the limitation is just the law, because the law just says that it has to be your own risk. So that's it. But then there is a flexibility, but then, uh, more often than not, the flexibility is not given, because uh, especially if it relates to relation risk, uh, because they have Bank Nagara uh, after all, to look for a domestic risk to be insured by the, the Bagnagara boys. So, yeah, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, at this point of time, no. But, you know, you can always appeal, yeah. And now I'm going to put Balian on the spot. Balian, do you have joint venture partners go through your captive? Yes. No, when I say yes, meaning that the, the, it's a joint operating company. That's number one. Number two, I think, uh, which uh, Lawrence rightly put out, is more on the control. So control, there are two parts, meaning the one that really run the, the asset, the plan itself, that's number one. Number two, is also equally important, the, the flow of information. So if, for example, it's somebody else that run the, is the operator or, the, or run the plan, then whether you have access to what the, are they doing. Because from then, they give you comfort on the risk itself. So you don't want to ensure that you don't know anything about it. So, so I think that's the, that, that part. So yet the answer is you can have third party, but it has to be uh, something where you have a controlling interest is But satisfies. I think as a captive, maybe I go to basic, maybe some still still try to figure out a captive. It's go back to the unity mandate, that's number one. And then also on the, um, uh, your, when you set up the company, it's under the MOA, the memory or articles, what is actually business that you want to put in there. So I think that's also part that you have to make sure it's there. Okay, let's move on to the next question. How do the insurance industry players, including captive owners, address the risk of social inflation? Lawrence, you want to kick that one off again? Yeah, I've, I've read that question a few times. Um, is that the time? I think my watch has stopped. Um, three minutes. <laughs> three minutes. You're not helping. So, um, yeah, uh, social inflation. I, I'm, I'm not sure. Do we mean just inflation for everybody? Um, 
And I imagine it refers to yeah, okay. obviously uh, general inflation. Yeah. So let's 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 um, let's take that. I'm not sure I can answer that either, but let's take that. So um, I think I think the captive can be something that aids. Um, it is more of an aid when it comes to inflation because you have control over that. I think with the insurance industry, um, clearly very much linked to the clients that they insure. And the clients they insure are subjected to all kinds of supply chain and fuel costs and inflationary pressure right now. And who can they pass that on to? They pass it on to their customers. And, and, and what do the customers do? They, 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 you know, they're all looking for wage increases to go, go with that 10 to 15% inflation, depending on what each country you're in. So it's, it's a massive issue. Um, and so presumably those insurance companies uh, are going to start putting their premiums up as, as the risks go up too. I think every, the cost of everything's gone up um, and insurance is going to be no, is not going to be um, um, immune from that. Um, but again, I think in terms of a captive owner, the benefit becomes, again, you can start to get more control uh, of the of the of the of your insurance cost through the use of a captive um, to try and pull that down. I'm not sure that that's clearly not going to address um, the, what we're calling social inflation itself, but uh, it can do go some way to helping. I think the um, the captive owner uh, and their inflationary pressures that they that they feel. I think yeah. it's a a captive to my mind is a sort of um, a large element of stability in a very unstable world. Yeah, I think uh, social social inflation at the moment is, is quite low in Malaysia, so it shouldn't be impacting too heavily. I know that uh, certain products, perhaps, if you're looking at coal or gas, have been shooting up. So someone like Balian may have his underwriters price in gas at a certain price in the month of, uh, say, May, and now we get to September and the price of gas is an all-time high. Uh, can you comment a little bit on inflationary pressures for, for premiums and does that affect your captive? Okay, inflation, first part is on the on the, the risk that you're going to insure. So meaning that the value of the asset can increase. So the first part of the inflation, then you can see the underwriter now push for you to do the valuation to make sure they understand what is the, the actual risk at this time. Number two, from captive or even on the insurance company, I believe it's more on the, the current Inflation may also involve on the price of steel. Also, it can to certain extent uh, impact on the the investment as well as the if you are doing insurance for the for the mass, then the inflation will look into the penetration of the buyer. So, if the inflation, there may be buyer will think that insurance no longer become priority to them, so they may shift their behavior in, in buying insurance. So, so that, that's the way I look at it from, from inflation. Yeah. Okay, thanks. We'll shoot to the last question because we only have uh, one minute and 54 seconds left. How does the traditional insurer perceive captives? Aren't they your competitor? So, Lawrence. Um, in, in a word, yes. I suppose um, captives are, uh, can be a thorn in the side of the insurer, if you like. And, and why is that? Because... Um, because you know a captive is going to take away the cream that they want, right? So um, you know they want the profitable premium, and, uh, and my view of a captive is one of its big aims should be subject to a company's risk tolerance. You know, take profitable premium away from the insurance market. So yeah, there's, there's comp competition there. That said, the market needs to work with the captive captive space. You know, there's now maybe six and a half thousand captives around the world. Um, they're not going away. Um, uh, despite every challenge that's come, come along, they've, they've come through it. And now in Asia Pacific, of that six and a half thousand, maybe we've got 3%, but it's definitely gonna grow. In my opinion, I'm very bullish about that. It's gonna grow. Look at the numbers that, the, that were talked about, Labuan going up this year, I think are, fine, are great. Um, really, really good. And, and the insurance market has to recognize that this is not going away and they need to work with them. Otherwise, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna lose the business completely. So I think it's, uh, I think it's beholden on, on the insurance industry to work with the captive industry uh, for the benefit of both ultimately. Okay, Nasri, thorn in the side or, or are they both nice blooming partners? No, I, if you talk about competition, I think uh, 
back, back in my broking years, nobody talked about captive. But today, you, you see a lot of brokers are looking into the captive solution. It is an evolving market, as Lawrence is saying. You can't avoid it. So you just have to live with it. I mean, so the insurers just need to live with the captive. Uh, okay. And Balian, last word. Partnership or something else? Uh, okay. I, I, actually, it's partnership. That's why I said the sweet spot. Which actually, when I start the CEO and the the end guest captive, I thought same thing. Is it competition? But then, eventually, actually, you have dialogue with them. Then you can find the sweet spot. So when you go sweet spot, actually, it's complement to each other. So they basically want the, the higher access point, and then and guess at the bottom point, and then some some gap. So so actually, if you find the sweet spot, then you can just complement each other. That's right. And then, and on top of that, we also have to deal with the local insurance company. So again, if the, the, the beauty of captive because we understand the risk better. So then, if you communicate with them, then actually you've got another complementary between captive and also the even the location company.